Well, again, thank you, Jane. Thank you so much for being here and taking the time. I know that you are quite busy and um, as you are a very prolific and wonderful writer, and I'm sure that you're busy working on more fantastic stories. So I want to say thank you for <laughs> taking the time. Um, so I, I also just want to start by sort of saying, you know, politics aside, the last few years have been really wild and crazy and chaotic and very complicated. So um, I almost want to start with the last line of your book, which was um, uh, the, the last quote, which was, I had it in my notes and now I don't, which was one of my favorite ways to end a book, which was, after all, why make things more complicated than they really need to be? Um, <laughs> because I, and I, I felt like your book was the perfect way to begin 2021 with uh, lightheartedness, um, the fantastical and the mundane mixed in together. And it just really started with such a lighthearted, happy way um, to begin. So I want to just one say thank you, because this is a great way to enter 2021. And also, what what made you was there anything particular that made you want to write this book or anything that inspired you or if you can talk a little bit about that story? Well, I wrote, I started writing it um, or thinking about it a long time ago. Um, there's a woman in Paris or outside of Paris who trains racehorses, this is a totally interesting woman and I want her to write her own book but she doesn't have time to do it because she has so many racehorses in her stable. Anyway, in 2009, she was just starting out and um, I went for a visit to her place, which was, um, in a beautiful, it wasn't like an American training area. It was basically an old estate that was um, in a forest and I loved it. And then my husband was with me and we, we went to have uh, some dinner and we went to a place called the Place de Trocadero and had French onion soup. And at the time I had um, a filly of my own who was, who had not done well at the track. She, I, she was, she, it did, she didn't have it in her she, <laughs> for various psychological reasons. Anyway, she, um, I, I, I was very fond of her though. And I was riding her at the time. And I was looking around at this place, which is on the west side of the Seine um, where there's a steep slope um, and a lot of beautiful gardens and old cemetery. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if a horse escaped from the race racetrack and came here? This would be a great place for a racehorse to hide out and to also enjoy yourself. And it turned out to be a great place because it's such an open spot on the west side. There's the Champ de Mar and um, there's other parks. And so that got me going. And once I started thinking about it, I thought, wow, I just can't stop doing this. I had other projects going. And so I would do those and then go back to this. And this was kind of my vacation project. I, I enjoyed it so much. And then um, I, I kept riding that horse and she became, she, I still, I don't ride her anymore, but she's, she's still my friend. And I became more and more interested in her psychology. Oh, wow. And um, so it was really fun since I was so fond of her, it was really fun to write a book. She's very vain, according to the animal communicator. She, oh, she's, no way. <laughs> she's always saying, you know, I'm very pretty. <laughs> oh, she know? That's amazing. Do, so do you ride off, do you ride race do you, like a jockey or how, how oh, does that I'm too tall to be a jockey um I ride English and I I would say I ride a sort of dressage style or something like that but actually mm -hmm. I just do the best I can <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing I mean those are that's a difficult um dressage is very difficult and uh, uh it's so beautiful I I love dressage I mean yeah. I'm not great at it myself nice. I do. I did have one horse. The first horse I got <clears throat> as an adult, <clears throat> I kept him um, near uh, where I live at a place that had been a, a, a racehorse training facility. 
and they still had the training track and they actually still do. And so I had this racehorse and he had had, he had had, I think 30, he had some huge number, oh, 52 starts and he was still sound. And one time I was on this training track and I thought, okay, I'm just gonna see what it feels like. And so I bridged my reins and I leaned forward and he took off mm -hmm. and I didn't see a thing because my eyes were watering so much. <laughs> <laughs> we were going so fast but he was very imagine. reliable and I said well I'll never do that again but I'm glad I did it at that one time sure <laughs> let it be the last I'm sure yeah. I um yeah. I, I did a tv show for a while about I, I played a, a a sort of jockey and uh I remember when we were rehearsing and such on the track the the wranglers were very adamant about not making noises don't kick huh. don't you know because yeah. they are you know, often to the races. Um, so um, what track, what show is it first? Let me ask it, it was called Wildfire, it was a very long time ago, but oh. um, about 20 years ago. But uh, it, it was a girl and a horse, and the horse could do all kinds of fantastical things from <coughs> ride Western and go oh. off in the woods. And up, it was based out of um, the Bay Area. And so oh. my character goes to Fremont and she's, and then suddenly she, the horse is on a track and she's the winning racehorse. So oh, it kind cool. of expands everything, which is kind of silly, but um, that's for me, leaning into the, you know, the horse's mind and curiosity factor. I just, it really sung and spoke to me because I, horses all have different personalities yeah, and do. Yeah, and thank you for understanding that because that's one of the things that people keep asking me is how did I get into the mind of the horse in my book? And I, I keep saying for people who ride, it's absolutely natural because you have to. If you can't get into the mind of the horse, they're going to dump you at some point. Exactly. And especially a thoroughbred um, because thoroughbreds are so quick. And so... Um, it was basically after years of saying, well, what's she thinking and what's she looking at? And oh, okay, I see that. And then trying to figure out what her temperament was like. It was just one step to go into her mind and see what she's thinking about Paris. <laughs> well, and I love that. And I, you know, going into the mind of a horse, you know, their instincts, especially with a thoroughbred, you know, if you have a quarter horse, they're more like golden retrievers where they'll just lay, roll over, and, you know, just want to live on you. And, you know, the thoroughbreds are like, it almost has, a, they almost have this sort of real animal carnal instinct to always be in fear and what, where am I going? And, you know, they're just these gorgeous they have animals. Yeah. They, if you look at videos of races, quite often they're so close together. They have to be constantly aware of where they are in the group and um, what might happen next. And so they are, they're very smart. Mm -hmm. And that's what I liked about them. I mean, I probably should never have tried to breed racehorses, but the first one, oh the, the one that I galloped on that track, he was such a great horse. I enjoyed him so much that he sort of inspired me to do it. And the good thing about it was that they, all of mine were related to one another. And so I could um, see how they differed. I could see sort of the nature nurture thing going on in horses. And so they had some characteristics that were quite similar to one another because they were all very observant and active mm -hmm. and smart and kind. But then they were all different from one another, too. For example, one a couple of them just loved to jump. If you could put them in a, a, a arena and where there were jumps, and they would just go jump them. They liked it. Yeah. Um, and then others, no, no, no way am I ever going to jump. Um, don't even ask. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was really fun to um, see the differences in their in their temperaments yeah i know a hundred percent and i think the perfect setting to really explore their curiosity is in a massive city like paris with all the different arrondissements and neighborhoods and it almost seems like you know as raul is traveling around like different <laughs> countries almost you know from the jardin de plants to the trocadero and 
it's all it seems like a foreign country Paris is um, such an interesting city and one of the things i've loved to do is just walk around in the past um and just check out different neighborhoods and see how unusual they are and how different they are from one another i i just her journey process journey i was just very inspired by her you know her natural instincts to be wary and you know have a horse's instinct of like where's the danger but at the same time very curious you know her curiosity leads her on a whole new adventure and almost an entirely new life for a second there and and, and eventually it does you know her whole um situation and lifestyle does change when she ends up back in the barn um you know and, and i just love it was almost like a road less traveled sort of thing like i'm gonna get out of my comfort zone and try something completely different um, so I get what I'm wondering is how that spoke to you, or do you find that you lean into that at all? Or are there moments that you maybe have gone down the road less traveled or where's your curiosity <laughs> led you? Oh, I'm a very curious person. I mean, from the, from the literary point of view, I love all kinds of novels. And so my curiosity has led me to try various forms and, um, and that's been a lot of fun. I don't know what my career would have been like if I decided that I was going to, you know, specialize in one thing or another. Um, and and what surprises me is that critics or publishers or other people seem surprised that I would try so many different forms. But why wouldn't you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I also love to travel and. Um, <laughs> probably one of the best experiences of my life was that when I graduated from college, um, there, it was a very bad time for getting a job. It was 1971. I don't remember why it was a bad time for getting a job, but probably it was because all the boomers were flooding the job market. So um, my husband at the time and I put together some money and we hitchhiked around Europe for about 10 and a half months. Oh, wow. And we had both studied a lot of history and we, and we thought we knew stuff about European culture, especially medieval history. But it was just a revelation day by day and we loved it. And, um, and I've loved going to other places. I loved going to Iceland. I loved going to Greenland. You know, I loved just seeing new places. And I still, that's the thing I miss during the COVID is, you know, I, I, there's some places I haven't been to yet. Excuse you, COVID, get out of my way. <laughs> exactly. That's a polite way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I agree. I feel like what is really hard right now is the inability to get out and learn from other cultures and other people and it's really difficult to, for me, I feel like I have to go inward, which I'm like, I don't want to do that. I want to learn from other people right now and, you know, riff off each other. And, and I think, you know, that is so cool about these different characters. Not only are they um, different, you know, beings and like different personalities, but they're also different species, I suppose, you know, like from the birds to the horses to the dog. and the ducks and the humans and is there a is there more is there an allegorical sort of look to this that I like is there more that you can say to this because I'm you know like no, that's a, the allegory part is for the reader to decide I just made up the story and I, I put in the animals that were likely to be around I mean when I've been in Paris especially in the um, more natural areas, the ravens are just talking all the time. So I knew there had to be a raven and um, I knew there had to be a rat. And I, I did spend a bunch of time around the, the uh, Eiffel Tower. And now they've rebuilt, they've redone that area of the Champ de Mar a little bit. But when I was first coming up with the idea there were two big ponds and a very interesting uh, old bridge. And I did see mallards in the pond. 
um, in one of the ponds. So that's where I came up with that. So they, those were just animals that were likely. Then I looked up, um, I, I knew, I felt I knew enough about the horse and the dog to write about them. But I, I looked up the other animals to see what their natures were like and what their, you know, what their mating rituals were like and stuff like that. And so uh, I learned a lot about them. I never thought in the world, I never thought I would ever be interested in a rat, but I got, <laughs> to, be, I got to be quite taken with my rat. But, but that was black so rat, not a brown, brown rat. Brown rats are bigger, black rats are smaller. Uh, well, and I, we spent a lot of time in Paris as a family and my kids sort of befriended the rats, which I thought was really funny reading your book. I remember sitting out on, um, mm -hmm. I forget what park we were at, but they were feeding the rats and they'd come up and I was like, oh gosh, this is so gross. Yeah. But I mean, I've I known people, I've known people who had pet rats. Mm -hmm. We did as kids. Oh. <laughs> you did? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't have some, that kind of luck. When, I mean, you're not missing anything, but your rats in the story, they're so, it, it's, it's a moment of, you know, you take a moment of pause because they're so, their personalities are so unexpected in a way, um, you know, in the way that we like view others. And it was a moment of like, oh, well, before I come in with a preconceived notion of something, um, you know, this is like, let's get to know them a little bit. And that's what it was like for these rats. And I also really loved the names. I'm not sure if it's from Heart of Darkness or not, but <laughs> and the Conrad was like super fun to see and sit in Nancy and stuff. And I loved their names because I felt the different, the father and son, the personalities. Um, one was more go with the flow and wanted to like be free. And it was, it was very sweet to watch them and then have them also interact with all the different animals but then Etienne as well was just a really sweet sweet moment so that was a lot of fun yeah I was fond of Etienne I I hated to be one of those authors who tortures small children um, <laughs> <laughs> you know his grandmother his great-grandmother is is a, is good and she's nice to him and um she treats him well. She he has to mature a little more than most eight year olds, but you know that's the case in old literature about children. I was I've been reading the Fountain Overflows by Rebecca West, and so she's talking about being a child at the beginning of the twentieth century, and it's so evident that more is expected of her as a child that from our perspective, you can barely even, you can't even figure out how old she is. She could be 10, she, you know, she's just finished playing with dolls, so she could be eight, she could be 10, she could be 13. But the way that children were raised and treated is quite different from the way they are now. And so, um, I don't know, ATN kind of harkens back to old style you know mm -hmm. yeah very much I mean he has to stick by the family raise his grandmother or great-grandmother now and to have the harsh realities that he has to face with losing his own family and then raise himself and his great-grandmother um, and then have this really sweet moments with these animals where his great-grandmother missed completely you know um yeah. for many reasons but it, it was a, it was that perfect balance it was a really sweet he's such you're just rooting for him the whole way it was really a sweet moment yeah he's a nice um, boy and so speaking about you know old times and books and uh, you know I know that Etienne reads a lot what are things for you are there books that inspire you or that you look back on or read over again oh, of course yeah but I think the big moment for me was my senior year in college during vacation, I decided to read Our Mutual Friend. And I sat up on Christmas Eve night and read, everybody else had gone to bed and I just sat there reading Our Mutual Friend and I totally adored it. And it, probably that was one of my major inspirations. I was always, already 
already trying to read, I mean, trying to write, but I thought, wow, this is so good. I just have to try this out. I just have to do this. So Dickens was a big motivator for me um, when I was growing up. How oh, cool. I can, I, now that you say that, I can see that, I can, I can see the influence a little bit, the, the sort of tone and feeling. Well, one of the things that I liked about Shakespeare and Dickens, once I got used to them, was that they were willing to try all this different stuff out. And I guess I always thought, well, if they can, why can't I, you know? I love Jane Austen too, um, but the books I read of hers, they were very quite similar to one another in their, in their theme. Um, and, and we didn't, we were never assigned, I loved Middlemarch, but we were never assigned other books by George Eliot. So I didn't know that she tried this and that too. But um, that's what drew me to various authors that they were willing to try stuff. So I think taking on a book where animals come to life is really cool. And, and I don't, just the perfect timing of it. It's just so mundane and so fantastic at the same time. I keep saying that, but it's just everyday life where nothing happens and everything happens at the same time. <laughs> um, so I kind of feel like that's my year. Have you ever had writer's block? while working on a book? And if so, how did you get over it? Um, there were places where I was confused or I didn't know what I was doing. So I don't know if you'd call that writer's block, but I didn't, I, I sort of didn't know what I was gonna do next. And one of the ways to get over it for me is to go where the book is set and look around. Um, and this is a great excuse to travel. <laughs> yeah, it is. And the setting always gives me ideas of maybe of what's next. Now, the great thing about writing in our world is that the Google boy can go for you. Um, so there was a, there's a scene in the first volume of, um, the last hundred years trilogy, the volume called Sun Luck. And um, my, my, one of my main characters, Frank, uh, signs up for the Second World War and he's a sniper. Well, I didn't know anything about that, but the Google boy could take me to all these likely spots. Um, I, I would read about the, the, the Second World War and, and where the various American regiments were deployed um, and then I could get the Google boy to take me where the likely spot for Frank to have been a sniper would be. So that was interesting. Um, and uh, so that's one way. I think another way is just to do other kinds of research. Sometimes writer's block is because you don't know enough about your subject mm -hmm. to keep going. And so if you just go read some more books you'll learn. Um, That's great, because I also feel as though it takes the pressure off of feeling like, oh, I have to be creative, inspired. I think research, researching and feeling like, oh, I can just feed I myself. Think research is really important and really inspiring. Now- And empowering. One, and what? Empowering, just to be able to empower yourself. But one of my favorite books that I wrote is a book called Private Life. And it, it's about um, a, a sweet girl who gets married off by her mother to a crackpot. So the two mothers, the mother of the crackpot and her mother are friends from the same town. And the girl is plain and, and pretty reserved. And the guy is a crackpot. He just can't help himself. He is. So they they marry, the two mothers want them to get married because they can't marry anybody else. And so the girl sort of goes along with it. And the hard time, the problem I had as I was writing it was that I could not get inside the mind of the crackpot. I knew he was a crackpot. I knew what he was, what his ideas were. I knew sort of what his temperament was, but I couldn't see anything from his point of view. And it took a lot of drafts for me to figure that out. 
Um, and it also took a fair number of drafts for me to figure out how to analyze the young woman too. So that, I wouldn't call that a writer's block, but I would call that writer's head scratching. <laughs> so what did you do? How did you get in that mindset? Well, first thing I took it out of first person, it had been in first person. Um, and then I realized that for some reason, which I didn't quite know yet, this woman wouldn't have the um, courage to reveal her inner life. So then I had to figure out a reason why she wouldn't have that courage. And then I realized that something traumatic had happened to her um, when she was young. And to, to go and investigate her inner life would, would, be, would recall that episode. Um, but it also took a lot of research. I had to go to San Francisco because they lived up in Vallejo. They lived sometime in San Francisco. So they, I had to go to a particular Italian restaurant on, the, on Union Square and eat their bruschetta many, many times. And <laughs> it, was, it, was such, it was such a trial. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds really tough. <laughs> Your books are just so lovely to read and um well, my advice they, to a writer is always have a 14 year old around the house because keep it real 13 year old because that will help you get used to bad reviews <laughs> i think we face that a lot in our house because my husband he's a, a an actor well we're both actors but he's the the real actor in this house and um, <laughs> he's uh he's on a starring in a show right now called walker and often our kids will, our oldest is eight and a half and our youngest is um, three and a half and then we have a seven-year-old and they'll, they're, they're no filter as well. You know, we're watching his episode aired last night and all the kids are like, why, why are you making that face, dad? Like, why are you, why are you doing that? <laughs> so yeah, you, you always need someone there to keep you, keep it real. Well, but, just wait until they're 14. I can only imagine. You completely. <laughs> uh, I can't wait. Well, um, I just want to say thank you again. Thank you so much for your time and your wonderful books. And I'm really excited to see what's next. Thank you very much. It was lots of fun. Thank you.